Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity on this, I think, the second or third Sunday after Trinity. They'll all go into a long stream of Sundays after Trinity from now on. But uh, today we're particularly paying attention to the Feast of St. Peter. It's not normal for a saint to be celebrated on a Sunday morning because you're supposed to make sure that Jesus is front and centre on a Sunday. But Peter Tide is a very important day for the church. Uh, it's traditionally the time of year when uh, clergy were ordained to the diaconate and to the priesthood. Um, uh, it's one of the main times, the other one being Michaelmas in the end of September. Uh, and we really need to pray for those who are not being ordained at this time. Those who, because of the pandemic, uh, have had their ordination postponed uh, until a further date. So let us please uh, pray for them. And let's also uh, spend time focusing on St. Peter, who as well as being one of the most human of saints, was the greatest uh, first leader of that early church. To him, we have a great debt. So let's stand and sing our first hymn. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God is love. And we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Almighty God, we confess to you and to our fellow members in the body of Christ that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry. 
Forgive us our sins and deliver us from the power of evil. For the sake of your Son who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. God, who is both power and love, forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. reading is taken from the book of Acts. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realised that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognize them as companions of Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory to, to Christ, Christ our Saviour. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon Peter. Son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ our Lord. Now may the words on my lips and the meditation in my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So today we remember St. Peter the first leader of the church after Jesus and perhaps the man least skilled to be leader of anything. It's easy to think that Peter was a great man, when we talk about great man in the traditional sense. If you look at how the church treats him, he is there carved in stone both inside and outside many a church, whether they're named after him or not, dignified, bearded, wise, and normally looking rather aloof, often holding in his hand uh, keys to the kingdom of heaven. In the Vatican and Rome, the authority of the Pope is predicated on St. Peter, with the Church of St. Peter's in Rome built itself on the site of Peter's tomb. In that vast church around the echoing dome, in gold letters ten feet high, it says, Tu es Petra, Tu es Petrus, it's super hank edifico, edifico ecclesia meum. Oh dear, my Latin's not what it was. But that means you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. So let's have a look at that rock, shall we, on which the church was built. Because by today's modern building standards, I'm not sure it would pass control. The idea of church leadership really matters at the moment, particularly in this Crisis. Leadership in general is pretty tricky uh, in this 21st century, whether it's uh, religious or political or moral or business or any other kind of leadership. Is it because leaders are less competent and trustworthy and wise than they used to be? Or is it that we are more suspicious of leaders than we ever were? What sort of leadership do we look for? in our church, in our bishops and clergy and lay readers. Well, if you were a re recruitment consultant, you would definitely not choose St. Peter. I'm, I'd honestly wonder whether he would get through the selection process for priesthood these days. If you had a list of essential qualities and desirable attributes and minimum experience, Peter would not get an interview. It almost makes you wonder whether Jesus was choosing by a different set of criteria. Our gospel is Peter's finest hour, but as we all know, he had many other episodes which didn't measure up to that confession of Jesus as the Christ. In fact, about three or four lines later, Jesus says to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I've explained before that that could not necessarily mean, you know, go away, you devil. It might mean step back in line, you tempter. But either way, it's a, it's a fairly harsh comment and describes quite well Peter's mercurial ability to be deeply insightful and deeply thick in the space of about 30 seconds. And we all know the points in Peter's life uh, where he shows himself to be inadequate when he doubts Jesus and sinks beneath the waves, when he denies Jesus and weeps bitterly at his betrayal, when he gets shouted at by St. Paul because he's gone back on a decision, because he wasn't a very good leader and he didn't stick to decisions well. It's undeniable and it's a main part of the life of St. Peter as written in the Gospels and it's worth pulling back a bit and thinking about that. Now these days, a biography of somebody is, is warts and all. We love to get to the real person, especially if it's 
different from the public persona. But when the Gospels were written, there were biographies, ancient biographies of many people, and they were always nearly hagiographies. You never wrote anything bad about someone in a, in a biography. You would never produce a negative portrait of somebody. It just didn't happen. If you read the biographies of people like Socrates or Alexander the Great or the Caesars, if you look at the works of Diogenes or Herodotus, the purpose was to praise the subject of the biography, to show what a good moral life they led, and to show how they influenced the world for the better. And it was a defense sometimes against their more contentious actions. Now, okay, the Gospels aren't a biography of Peter, but they feature him. And when the Gospels were being written, he would have been large in the thinking of the writers. We've got to get back to that mindset of the early church. The Gospels were written shortly after the death of St. Peter and St. Paul. In fact, when the Gospels were being written, all of that first generation of Christians were dying out or dying off. They were persecuted, tortured, martyred, perhaps they died of old age or disease. And you might think that this was exactly the environment in which they needed the church to laud them as great saints and people of great virtue and courage that other people might follow their example. You would have thought this was the ideal opportunity to do what humans tend to do and turn them into semi-gods, demigods, so that we have an inspiration. But instead, the Gospels make it as clear as they can possibly be that Peter, the first great leader of the church, was human, flawed, broken, fault-ridden. Now that must have been deliberate. The Gospels don't tell us these things about Peter by accident. The Gospels are not hurriedly constructed. They were, they were carefully collated collections of stories and sayings and speeches gathered and edited for a purpose. The perfect example of that I mentioned in one of the, the uh, belief series that I've done online on the YouTube channel. Mark's Gospel deliberately omitted stories that Mark must have known about the resurrection. Mark's original gospel ending ends with an empty tomb and the women running away because they were afraid. There must have been a reason why Mark missed out the stories he knew. He did it deliberately and for a purpose. The best guess is because he wanted people who had read that gospel to engage with the Christian community to find out what happened next. But that's a perfect example of the fact that Mark omitted important stories for a purpose. So if Mark was happy to edit out the resurrection appearances, he must have taken time to edit in the stories of St. Peter getting it wrong. Stories of failure. Stories of shame. He left them in for a reason, and that reason, I think, is the key to understanding what we need as leadership in our church. So, what were they trying to tell us? Well, as we can see, that Peter had no great leadership qualities, uh, not leadership as we understand it. He genuinely didn't. Not according to what we would want as leaders today. Not according either to leadership in terms of the ancient biographies. He just didn't have the skills. But what did he have? Because it worked, didn't it? <laughs> he sustained the faith. He carried it on into the next generation. He was the first human leader of the largest religion that the world has ever known. So whatever he did was right. He wasn't a leader. That was right. That was what the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles are telling us he wasn't a leader. We don't need leaders. We need followers. He was a follower. He had the knowledge that so many leaders lack, which is that he knew he was inadequate to the task. He knew he did not have the skills or the intellect or the wisdom. 
He didn't try and hide that. He confessed it publicly many times when he got it wrong. What he did have was the humility to know that and a complete and utter reliance on the God who dictated his every move. He had a complete faith that God would give him what he needed to do God's will. That was Peter's great gift, not oratory, not decision-making, not wisdom. It was his utter need of God and his utter faith that God would give him what he needed. Again and again in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter and Paul and the leaders of the early church prayed before doing anything. Where to go, who to bring along, what to say, what to do. They prayed every hour of every day. Peter repented. He received forgiveness and with the joyous knowledge that he was forgiven and that nothing could separate him from the love of God, he went back about his business of preaching love, healing the sick and embracing the outcast and generally doing what God wanted him to do. And that's pretty much it. That is the leader of our church. That's what he did. He just kept doing it, kept refocusing himself every moment on discerning the will of God and then doing it. It's not complicated, this Christianity business. Just keep asking God what he wants and then give him what he wants because it's best for us and best for him and best for the world. And say sorry when you get it wrong. We don't need traditional leadership in our church. We need followership. We need to know that we need God and that we desperately need one another. We need to know that we have to help one another because we are all followers. We need to know that we have to do it and we need to know that unless God is front and centre and everywhere else, we will fail. Peter is the origin of that wonderful phrase, primus inter pares, first among equals. And that is why we are so very lucky to have him as our first human leader of the church. We follow not where he led. We follow the one he followed. And we pray this Peter tide for God to raise up in this church leaders who will do the same, to be the shepherd of the shepherds. Amen. Lord, as we come before you in prayer, still our minds that we may hear your voice, stir our hearts with the knowledge of your love, and grant us the strength to do your will. We all make mistakes. We let down ourselves and other people and you, Lord. The example of Peter gives us hope. He denies the Lord he loved three times through fear. He must have felt ashamed and guilty. But he didn't get stuck with those feelings of shame and guilt. He didn't focus on himself, but he focused on you and on the work of building your kingdom. He looked forward with hope and faith and love. When we make mistakes, when we hurt others and ourselves. Help us to make amends if we can and to move forward, focusing on you, not on ourselves. We pray for the leaders of this world. Grant them wisdom and understanding. Give them the humility of Peter that they may be followers of the ways of justice and of peace. We remember those struggling at this time, those worrying about how to feed their families, those trapped in small, crowded spaces, the lonely, the anxious, and the despairing. Calm their fears and share with them your peace and love. 
We pray for our church family here in Melrose, for all those we love but no longer see in our beautiful church. Help us to find new ways to show our love and support of each other. We remember those who have died and those who are dying. We remember those who mourn, those who could not be there to say goodbye. May they feel your loving presence and trust in your eternal love. Almighty God, you call us every day to follow your way. Help us to hear your call above the noise and clamour of our fears, to put aside distractions and focus on the life of the Spirit, so that we may rise up and follow you along the paths of righteousness. We ask these prayers in the name of your beloved Son, who died for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We meet in Christ's name. Let us share his peace. Let us present our offerings to the Lord. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Worship and praise belong to you, almighty God, in every place and at all times. All power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ your Son, 
Our life and yours are brought together in a wonderful exchange. He made his home among us, that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth in a creation restored by love. As children of your redeeming purpose, we offer you our praise. With St. Peter, with the angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. thanksgiving be to you, most loving Creator, for the gift of your Son born in human flesh. He is the Word existing beyond time, both source and final purpose, bringing to wholeness all that is made. Obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. By your power you raised him from the dead. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. On the night when he was given up to death, knowing that his hour had come, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. At supper with his disciples he took bread and offered you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. After supper he took the cup. He offered you thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We now obey your Son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts, and with them our frails, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful God, and send your Holy Spirit upon us. And upon this bread and this wine. That overshadowed by his life-giving power, they may be the body and blood of your Son. And we may be kindled with the fire of your love. And renewed for the service of your kingdom. 
Help us, who are baptised into the fellowship of Christ's body, to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love, until at last, in your new creation, we enter into our heritage, in the company of the Virgin Mary, the apostles and prophets, and of all our brothers and sisters, living and departed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be to you, Lord of all ages, world without end. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. As our Saviour Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to share in his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Amen.
Let us give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious, and his mercy endures forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love fulfills the law. May we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And may we love our neighbor as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now may Christ give us grace that we may follow St. Peter and all the saints in the ways of faith, hope, and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all for whom you pray, now and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.